be seated. Matthew 5 is where we're turning. Matthew 5, we do have some handouts back here in the back, so if you need one, uh, Mark's back here, so maybe if you need one, maybe wave your hand at him and he can grab you one, but it'll give you how to, how to follow along with where we're going. We're in Matthew 5, we're going to be in verse 43. Matthew 5 and verse 43. I apologize for my voice. My allergies have finally kicked in for this season. They usually don't last long, but uh, if all of a sudden I start sounding like Kermit the Frog, you'll know what's going on, and it's nothing personal. All right. Matthew 5, 43. Jesus has been going over the law of Moses. So we start out in the Sermon on the Mount. Initially, you have the, the nine Beatitudes. We, call them the, the, we could call them the secret keys, but they're not secret. Jesus tells us exactly what's going on. So we have the Beatitudes, and then Jesus kind of goes from the Beatitudes into explaining not just the law of Moses in the letter of the law, but explaining the spirit of the law. In doing this, he's, he's doing two things. He's kind of accomplishing, killing two birds with one stone, if you want to say it that way. He's revealing the futility of self-righteousness or works-based salvation, because as we go down through Matthew 5... And you see how he expounds upon the law, you realize, boy, I'm, I'm guilty of that, and I'm guilty of that, and I'm guilty of that, which is what the law is supposed to do. We've learned in Galatians, the law is our schoolmaster to bring us to grace. But the other thing that Jesus is doing is revealing the hypocrisy of the religious leaders of his day. As we've been going through Luke on Sunday mornings, we've talked a lot about the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all of that that ilk, if you want to call them that, those people, they felt like they were good enough. And they felt like they were good enough, number one, because of their heritage. Well, I'm a Jew. <laughs> I, have the right, I have the right heritage. I have the right parentage. I'm good. And then on top of that, they were also meticulous followers of the law. And I'm going to put that in quotes because they weren't following what Jesus was saying. But then also their traditions. Remember, Moses gave us the five books of the law. Of those, really three contain the actual laws. The Pharisees and Sadducees had expanded the, the three books of the law of Moses to 12 books that make up the Mishnah or the, the traditions that they were supposed to follow. Because they had reduced the law of God to a series of physical acts. The religious leaders were able to declare that they had kept the law sufficiently. Well, I've never killed anybody, and by that I mean I've never actually taken a knife and ended someone's life with it. So I have always stopped short of breaking that commandment. I've never committed adultery because I've never actually done the act. Well, I've never done it because I've never committed the physical act. So they took the law of God and they condensed it down to a, a list of acts. That you can't do. And because they hadn't done that actual thing, I'm good, was kind of how they felt. But if you look at verse 20, Jesus says, For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed, okay. it, meaning it needs to be more or less, more, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. The scribes and the Pharisees were the most spiritual people that anybody knew. When you wanted to, well, what does a spiritual person look like? Well, it looks like that guy. See, he's got all of the right, he's got all the right clothing on. He's got the right hair. He's got the phylacteries. Remember the boxes of scripture that you'd hang on your head and your hands? He's got all of that. He's good. He's, he's what you should be. And Jesus says, you see that guy who's as good as it gets? You got to be better than that. And so everybody would have said, but I can't be better than that. To which Jesus would say, you're absolutely right. You can't be better than that. You need the righteousness of someone else. So Jesus is taking this time to expound upon the spirit of the law. To do this, Jesus has stated the law. And you'll look, if, as you're reading through Matthew 5, it will say something to the effect of, you heard it said of old time. And then he expounds the heart of the issue. So in old time, the, the law says, thou shalt not kill. Jesus says that whoso hateth his brother without cause is guilty of murder. 
He's covered murder, adultery, oaths. Last week, we looked at Jesus teaching about the law of retaliation. You remember when we talked about an eye for an eye? It, that's, that's a quote from the Old Testament, but Jesus gave everything about it. And to this evening, Jesus is going to expound upon the second greatest commandment. The second greatest commandment. Look at verse 43, the first part of the verse. <clears throat> Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor. This statement from Scripture is probably one of the most well-known statements in all of Scripture. I would say that people know, Thou shalt love thy neighbor more than they know. John 3.16, and John 3.16 is pretty well known. You hear this statement is wrenched out of its context to support every imaginable position. I came across this this afternoon. I wasn't looking for it, and I came across somebody using this position to justify their political standpoint. Maybe you've heard it this way. You should be all right with giving your money to the welfare system because Jesus said, love your neighbor. You ever heard anything like that? Well, well, you should embrace a woman's decision to murder her unborn child because Jesus said, love your neighbor. Now, now they wouldn't phrase it like that. They, they kind of adjust the verbiage a little bit, but that's one of the arguments that's used. Well, you should vote the way I do because my party is the one that loves their neighbor, and that's what Jesus told us to do. Have you heard this? Or am I living in an echo chamber? Have you heard this? I, I hear this. Just, uh, this is not... Part of the message, but Jesus did not delegate loving your neighbor to any government, okay? So we, we need to remember that. Who did Jesus say to love their neighbor? Was he talking to the Romans? Was he talking to the Jewish government? No, he was talking to individual disciples of Christ. So just had to get that off my chest there. <laughs> God gave that mandate of loving your neighbor to individuals, not to government. So the fact that you say, well, my political party, it loves my neighbor. Well, you love your neighbor and let the government do what the government's supposed to do would probably be a really good idea. But is that really what this verse is saying and the many others that echo this? Well, obviously not. The word love is the Greek word agape, which is one you've probably heard messages on agape love. Agape love is self-sacrificial love. It's purposing someone else's good at my expense. When the Bible says, for God so loved the world, it's this type of love. God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son. That is a sacrificial love. And so this passage here, love thy neighbor, is that same sacrificial love, that same love that God had that caused him to sacrifice Christ is the same love that I'm to have for the world. Now it says here in verse 43, ye have heard that it hath been said. Okay. Now as we have in all of our past messages here, let's look back and see where it was actually said. In your handout you have Leviticus 19.18. This is where it is said first. Thou shalt not avenge, nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, I am the Lord. This command is repeated throughout the New Testament. I have gave you a list of references there. And I, I have in your handout Matthew twenty-two thirty-six 36, because this is probably the best known place where Jesus had this conversation. Look at it. This was somebody asking Jesus a question. He said, Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now we have gone into great detail on this. You can boil down all ten of the ten commandments to two commandments, really just one, but if you want to make it two... The, the first four commandments have to do with man's relationship with God. And if we love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, strength, then will we make a graven image? No. Why? Because I love the Lord. If we love the Lord the way that we're supposed to, will we use his name flippantly? No. Why? Because I love the Lord. 
And if I love my neighbor as myself, so if I'm loving God, it's going to take care of this relationship. If I love my neighbor, am I going to steal his stuff? Am I going to kill him? No. Why? Well, because I'm obeying the law and the prophets, as Jesus says here. But if you look there in your handout at verse 39 of Matthew 22, do you notice any difference between what Jesus said in Matthew 22, 39 and what Jesus says the, is being said in Matthew 5, 43? There's something missing between the two verses. In Matthew uh, 22, 39, he says that thou shalt love thy neighbor. There's two words right after that. As thyself. That's missing from Matthew 5. Because Jesus is saying, this is what you hear. This is what the, the Pharisees and the scribes and the religious leaders are doing. They say, love your neighbor. And they cut it off right there. They had eliminated the as thyself part. Why? Well, the Pharisees had perverted this commandment, not just through subtraction, but also with addition. Neither of which you should do to God's word. You don't take away and you don't add to God's word. They had done both. Look at verse 43. Here's what was said. Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. Does that sound like a command of God? No. Why doesn't that sound like a command of God? Because it's not one. <laughs> they had made this up whole fall, and now Jesus is calling them on the carpet for it. They said, you love your neighbor. Just love your, well, well, what does that look like? Just love your neighbor. Well, what does that look like? Well, it looks like loving your neighbor. Okay, they were, they were being politicians about it. They weren't giving a whole answer. And they said, and you need to hate your enemy. And God never said anything of the kind. The love of the Pharisees, well, when they talk about loving themselves, they thought pretty highly of themselves. The Pharisees thought they were rarefied air. The only person who approached the level of love from the Pharisees that they had for themselves were, can you guess, who, who else merited that kind of love? Pharisees. Other Pharisees. Yeah. Well, well, this is, this is brother so-and-so. I love him like myself, but that's, that, I don't want that publican over there. Are you kidding me? No, he's just above a dog. No, I don't, I don't love him, but I, but I love this guy. With, with, their, with themselves, they had this kind of love. The love of the Pharisees was reserved for themselves and others who were like them. And when it came to their enemies, they had added this phrase, and hate thine enemy. <clears throat> now, I'm going to give the Pharisees probably more, uh, more slack than they deserve here. Is there any place in the Old Testament that you could construe to say that you should hate your enemies? Well... Let me give you what I found. Perhaps you could look back at the book of Joshua. What did God tell the children of Israel to do to the people of the land of Canaan under Joshua? They were to come in and they were to wipe out everyone. Man, woman, child, everything was to be gone. That's one place that maybe you could turn to to say that. There's another place in Psalm 139 Verse 21, this is David speaking, and he says, Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? And am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. Is that a command to hate our enemies? Well, there are many imprecatory psalms. An imprecatory psalm is one that calls down judgment. Let me give you one. I, I'm... You ever been in a church where sometimes you'll read a psalm together as a church body? This is one that you don't often hear read. Psalm 58, verse 6 says, Break their teeth, O God, in their mouth. Break out the great teeth of the young lions, O Lord. Let them melt away as waters which run continually. When he bendeth his bow to shoot his arrows, let them be as cut in pieces. Why, why don't we read that often in well, because it makes everybody uncomfortable when we're asking God to break people's teeth out. Okay? But it is in Scripture. Okay, So is it possible that, the, that these Pharisees, and again, I'm giving them more slack than they deserve. Okay, But I am going to make the point, 
You can look at the Old Testament and you can see the God of judgment quite regularly in the Old Testament. If you were to study the imprecatory psalms, though, you would find that David, or whoever the psalmist was for that particular psalm, was never declaring a personal vendetta. It was never, Lord, I hate these people, and I'm going to go out and kill as many of them as I can. You'll never find that in Scripture, not, not, certainly not in Psalms, and only, uh, again, in the book of Joshua, only under the express command of God, when God said, this people is to be gone, or in First or Second Samuel. They're never declaring a personal vendetta. They're never seeking vengeance. They're always declaring that they hate the sinful works of the enemies of God. So when David calls down judgment, he's not putting on his, I don't know if they had brass knuckles back then or not. He's not putting on brass knuckles and saying, break their teeth, Lord. And that's not what he's doing. He's saying, Lord, you see what they're doing. Judge them. He's calling down judgment from God, but he's not going out and trying to take matters into his own hands. Regardless of if the Pharisees had some biblical principle that they were twisting to, for their purposes, or if they were merely allowing nature to take over, God never commands the hatred of our enemies. You can search high and low through Scripture. You won't find that. Rather, he does give the law of love. Look at verse 44. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Huh. Well, that's, that's a little bit different than what we were just reading. That's a little bit different than the hatred of our enemies. Once again, Jesus is declaring his deity and his superiority to Moses by contrasting the law of Moses by saying... But I say unto you, if, if I was reading to you from Scripture, and I was reading God's Word, and I said, but I say, you'd say, no, no, you don't have that kind of authority to speak above God's Word. But Jesus has the authority to speak on God's Word and to, to explain in whatever way he sees fit. Because ultimately, who wrote the Law of Moses? God, and, and who is Jesus? God. So, interestingly, these Pharisees are trying to, they're, they're getting a lesson on the law from the one who wrote it. He says to them, love your enemies. This is the same Greek word, agape, as was commanded for our neighbors. I am to have a self-sacrificing love for my enemies. Not just my neighbors, my enemies. We're to be self-sacrificing. We're to act in a deferential way towards our enemies. That's, that's pretty radical. In Jesus' day, that was unusual. In our day, that's unusual. But he goes on. Not just love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. The word bless is the word eulogio. Maybe you hear the word eulogy in there. When you go to a funeral, somebody stands up and they deliver the eulogy. And they stand up. Many times it's lies about the person who is laying in the casket before you. Okay? But you stand up and you say good things. Jesus says, love your enemies with a self-sacrificing, deferential love and speak well of them. Speak well of them. Bless them which curse you. The word curse means to execrate or to doom. So that's what they're speaking to me. They're calling down curses on me. And what am I supposed to do in return? I'm supposed to call down blessing on them. That's not natural. There's nothing natural about this. What is natural when someone's calling down doom on you? To hate that person. To ball up and get them as fast as you can. But Jesus says, no, 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 no. Love them with a self-sacrificing love. Eulogize them, not at their funeral either. Speak well of them. Say good things. This actually goes along with the command of Proverbs 25, 21, where we read, If thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he be thirsty, give him water to drink. Now, the next verse, I don't have it there for you, in Proverbs 21, 20, 25, 22, says, And in so doing, you'll heap coals of fire on his head. So when we are nice, when we do go 
against what is natural, it does have an effect. He says to do that. Then he also says to do good to them that hate you. That's unnatural. When somebody hates me, they're doing bad things to me, and I'm supposed to return good for evil. He says, pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. The word despitefully use means to slander, to falsely accuse, or to threaten. That's Maybe you've been on the receiving end of some of that. Somebody said something about you that just was patently false. They were making it up. They were lying. And, and Jesus foresaw that. He says, pray for them that despitefully use you. D don't go and try to start another campaign to get everything overturned. Don't tear them apart on Facebook. Don't try to do all of these things. Rather, pray for them. Pray for the person who despitefully uses you or persecutes you. To persecute means to make, to run, to flee, or to drive away. It's pretty intense. There's a lot going on here. These four statements are radically countercultural, and they're also unnatural, as I've said several times. This is not, when you go to the doctor and he tests your reflexes, your reflex is what you do without thinking, okay? When someone is giving you evil, your reflex action is to deal out evil in kind. Your reflex action, when someone strikes you on the right cheek, is to lay them out. What should you do? Well, we looked at this last week. You turn the other cheek. All of this goes together. It's, it's very unnatural. The, fame, the, the Pharisees were, were famous for looking down on others and for their imprecatory prayers. <laughs> they weren't above standing up in the synagogue on Sunday and calling down fire from heaven on so-and-so who was sitting in the congregation. They would do that. That was, that was kind of their M.O. They look down upon the, the publicans, the harlots, the Samaritans, the Galileans, the working class. Uh, by the way, who did Jesus spend most of his time with? That list I just read to you, the publicans, the harlots, the, the, the outcasts of society. They hated the Romans as well. They were willing to show affinity to those who were like them. Yeah, I, I like I like Pharisee so-and-so. We're, we're, we're on good terms, but I don't like these people. That was their, their, their way. But Jesus stood their worldview on its head by saying that God intended for them to show differential, self-sacrificing love, not just for their neighbors. That's hard enough sometimes, but for their enemies, for those who were doing them wrong. In order to, our last point here, we see a family resemblance. Look at verse 45. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. Now, as you're looking here, if you look at verse 45, it says that we are to love our neighbor and love our enemies... Do good to those who hurt us and all of this stuff, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. Now the phrasing here could cause a casual reader to think that this is how one becomes a child of God. Do you see how that could be? As you read it, it says, that ye may be. We would say, if, if you were looking at, at the military, you say, you have to go to boot camp, that ye may be a soldier. That's not what this is saying here. The, the phrasing could be confusing. If you look back at verse 9 of this chapter, it's another verse that could be taken kind of that way. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Which makes us kind of feel like, well, if I want to be called a child of God, then I need to be a peacemaker, right? And if I'm a peacemaker, if I'm the one who gets people to put down their knives at the family reunion, if I'm that one, then I'll be called a child of God. Is, is that the case? Do you become a child of God by being a peacemaker? No. Do you become a child of God by loving your enemies? No, it's not how you become a child of God. It's an evidence of a child of God. 
Only a child of God can actually do this. It's not how you become a child of God. This is the evidence that you are. One doesn't become a child of God by doing anything. But being a child of God will be evident by my behavior. By their fruits ye shall know them. This is one of the fruits that if, if somebody sees you get slapped on the right side and rather than laying the person out, you turn the other cheek, that's unnatural. What are they going to say? There's something different about you. Why did you do that? And it, why? Well, because I'm a child of God and that's what my Lord told me to do. If somebody sees you loving not just the lovely, but loving your enemies... That's a sign, it's a, a symptom, if you want to call it that, a fruit of being a child of God. For, here in verse 45, for he maketh his son, this is speaking of the Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. So who does the Father send rain on? Everybody. Everybody. The us, the, the, the just and the unjust, regardless of their, their deservedness. Aren't, aren't you glad that God doesn't give you rain on your fields according to your worthiness? <laughs> or, or, or give you anything according to your worthiness? Aren't you glad of that? God gives rain on the just and on the unjust. So who should a child of God show love for? Well... We should be like the rain that the Father sends. We should love the just and the unjust. We should love those who hate us. We should love our persecutors. We should love those who speak ill of us. We should just love all men. Verse 46, Jesus is going to get... Uh, uh, if you remember that Jesus is... As he's giving this, he's on a hillside up to the north of the Sea of Galilee, and he's got a big crowd of people. But he would have had the Pharisees. They would have been there off in the, in the, on the peripheral, out on the fringe of the crowd. They were there because they were listening to hear what Jesus would say so that they could trap him in something. So they're listening. And look at what Jesus says because Jesus kind of throws a grenade their way. Look at what he says. He says, for if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? Who, who, do the, who do these people, who do these religious leaders hate more than anybody? Publicans. Oh, they're terrible. And what did Jesus just liken them to in front of everybody? Publicans. He said, if you love the people who love you back, that's natural. That makes sense. Of course you love. Of course you love the person who loves you and gives you things. Of, of course you love them. But, but that's what publicans do. Can you imagine around the collars of all of the Pharisees, it starts to kind of get red and starts to go up their face as they hear this. This rabbi from Nazareth, he just said that my righteous, my love is like a public. And Jesus doesn't let up. He just, he doubles down in verse 47. And if you salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so? <laughs> the, the word salute here, meaning to greet, to embrace, to welcome. If you only greet the people who are just like you, that's not special. That's not spiritual. <laughs> that's natural. And again, even publicans do that. The IRS agents of the first century, even they do that. Come on now. Here in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is describing the life of a true disciple. This is, we've entitled this series Kingdom Life because that's what Jesus is laying out. This is for you and me too. You and We don't deal with publicans, at least we don't call them that. Again, they would be the IRS agents of, of the world today. But, but you have people who are hard to love in your life. Okay? If you do anything with the public, you know that some people, some people are easy to love. And some people are hard to love. Impossible from a human standpoint. 
But those are the people who Jesus is talking about. He's describing the life of a true disciple. He's describing one who is living for the kingdom. We went through uh, Colossians 3. Colossians 3, 2 tells us to set our affections on things above, not on things of the earth. This describes a person who has their eyes on heaven and they love everyone and they love all. Why? Well, because they're not tied up on, on earth with the relations here. Their real focus is on heaven and they see this person who's unlovely. Matt, they're hard. They're, di they're just a difficult person to be around. But when that person, when I see that person, I'm not looking at them as a pain in the neck. I'm looking at them as somebody who Jesus died for. And I, if Jesus can love them, then do you think Jesus can make me love them? Absolutely he can. This evening we've seen Jesus calling for those who follow him to show a radical, countercultural, unnatural love. Don't just love those who are easy. Love those who are hard. Everybody loves their friends. Most people love their family. But Jesus bids us to love those who are not like us. In fact, he tells us to love those who are actually working against us. It, is it easier to love your family, an absolute stranger, or that person who gets under your, under your skin whenever you have to deal with them? Well, it's easy to, easiest to love your family, and then it's easiest to love a complete stranger because they haven't done anything to bother you. But I'm supposed to sacrificially love my enemies. And Jesus modeled this for us. Take a look at Romans 5. It's there at the bottom of your, your handout. Romans 5, verse 6 says, For when we were without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. I, I didn't get myself all presentable so that Jesus would love me so that he would die for me. He died for me when I was ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure, for a good man, some would even dare to die. There are instances of people dying for their friend. You know, it, it's going to be me or it's going to be him. And I choose to die in his place. There, there are stories of that. But rarely is this person a, a hardened criminal. <laughs> well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lay down my life so they can go on about their life. No, it's, it's for a friend or for a good person. But then we read, but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What was there desirable about you when God looked down from heaven, when God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son? What was it about you that made him want to? Well, nothing. I didn't have any redeeming qualities. I wasn't a little bit shinier of a sinner than everybody else. And God just said, well, I'm going to reach out and I'm going to save him. No, I was lost, undone, dead in trespasses and sins, according to other verses of Scripture. But God commanded his love toward me in that while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. He gave the ultimate love, the ultimate self-sacrifice. Only those who are born again into the family of God have the ability to, to truly love in this fashion. Now there, there are some, some lost people who are very benevolent and they're very, they're very generous and, and, and the world would tag it as loving. But only a believer, only someone who has the spirit of God living within them can truly accomplish this the way that God would have us to. We're going to get there on Sunday evenings, but what is the first of the fruit of the spirit listed in Galatians 5.22? Can you guess what kind of love? This kind. Self-sacrificing. The same love that God had for us. So, when will the fruit of the Spirit be shown in my life? Well, in Galatians 5, it says, if you walk in the Spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. If I'm connected to the vine, John 15, then I'll bear fruit. What fruit? Well, the fruit of the Spirit. And number one on that list is love. So, only as I'm connected to the love of Christ that made him do what he did in, in Romans, there where he died for sinners, 
only as i'm connected to the vine will will i as a branch be able to bring forth this fruit that will show itself as the love of god as we allow the spirit of god to manifest the life of christ through us we'll find that we're able to show the love of christ even for those who are unlikely candidates i would encourage you again all of us probably have somebody in our life we'd say I don't hate that person, but they're, just, they're hard to love. <laughs> they're, they're not easy. They're a hard one to love. I would encourage you. A, a prayer to pray would be something to the effect of, Lord, you know I can't love that person, so you love that person through me. Do you think God would do that? God would do that in all of the difficulties that we face. You say, Lord, I struggle with this temptation. I struggle with this, this issue of, of purity. I struggle with this issue of language. I struggle with this issue of pride. Lord, give me, give me your purity. Lord, help me to speak your words. Lord, help me to, help me to have your mind. In all things, God can do that. And, and there's probably no place that we need it more than in this issue of loving our enemies. Loving your friends is natural and easy most of the time. Loving your enemies, something else entirely, but it certainly requires the Lord's help.